Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Molly Carmichael with Zonda's Inspirational Leadership Series, joined by the industry's best in all things real estate. These leaders are literally designing our future for many generations to come with new communities, home designs, technology, retail centers, infrastructure, and so much more. This series is about who they are, how they got started, who inspired them, and their journey to the top. So let's get started. Today, we will hear from Cheryl Palmer, the president and CEO for Taylor Morrison Homes. Cheryl is a smart leader who holds her team high, and rightly so. She and her team represent one of the nation's largest home builders. In fact, in 2021, they closed almost 14,000 homes with a 22% increase in closings and revenue. In addition, they control another 77,000 lots planned for the future. But as important for Taylor Morrison, Taylor Morrison holds the title of America's most trusted home builder for six years in a row, and the company continues to be recognized as a great place to work because so many of Cheryl's employees, if you talk to them, love working for Cheryl. And, and that's huge when it comes to being an inspirational leader. So let's get started. Please welcome Cheryl Palmer. Thank you for joining us today. We are here with our inspirational leadership series and Cheryl Palmer. I uh, was thrilled to have her uh, with this interview and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Molly. It's truly a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, let's dive right in. I'm going to just jump right into the questions. And probably the, the most important question for you is what do you do every day? What is your job? It's such a fascinating question because, you know, I've been in this role for 15 years now and wow. the world changes. Yeah. That's crazy. That crazy. <laughs> and it's been a heck of a journey for those 15 years, but the company's evolved. My job has evolved, but there's some constants, right? Because now with it being, it's been a public company almost 10 years. Um, and so, you know, it's easy to default to, you know, what it takes to run a public company and strategy and we build communities and houses and all that's wonderful and certainly what the organization does. Um, but when I look at my real role and where I can add value, I'm here to serve our teams across the country. Um, and certainly it's about the vision and, you know, I've always said, Molly, when you get into, you move up the ladder and you get into a new role, you don't just get smarter that next day. <laughs> you just like overnight, wow, I have all this experience. <laughs> I'm pretty well, smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Um, you get access, right? Access to people, access to more information. And so when I look at the responsibility I have, it's how do I make sure all of that transcends the organization? How do they get that access to allow them to make better decisions? You have the right people in place. The rest almost takes care of itself. So our greatest assets are people. Um, and I think if I were to add one more thing, especially as the evolution of our world, our time, our company, it's really making sure we have a place of purpose for our team members across the country. Totally. And it doesn't matter the generation, you know, I agree. this is pre-COVID, maybe on steroids with COVID. But, you know, what we're, what we're spending our days on and making sure that that fulfillment and professional development, personal development, all that exists, because if I can get all that right, it's a home run. That's, that's pretty awesome. Let me ask you this. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, very honestly and bluntly, you know, have you always been like this? I mean, you're very people centric. It's what people love about you. And I think people you're, I think you're asked to speak a lot because of how people centric you are. And, and that's fascinating, but like, you know, it's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's inspiring to, to watch and, and frankly, to hear a lot of that. You don't hear that a lot. There's a couple of leaders that I would tell you, I do hear that from kind of, but even not with the same passion. It's great. Wow. No, thank you. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, I have to think about that. You know, I'll probably go back to my like childhood and say, <laughs> I moved a lot as a child. I think I was in like eight 
schools before junior high. And no, wow. my father wasn't in the military, <laughs> which is always the second question. Um, my mom was a fashion designer. And we moved so. from LA to Georgia, New York, back to LA. And, and so I just, and then different houses within those cities. So I had to adapt because as a child moving, kids aren't always the nicest. And then I had funny accents. I had a New York accent in Georgia and then a Southern New York draw <laughs> back in LA. And so you really have to evolve how you, the, how you develop relationships. And I, I think through that, I got such an appreciation that people are all so different and there's such beauty in that. Right. And that if I could I agree. Response, Right. I mean, mm -hmm. if everyone's the same, what a boring life we'd live. Um, and certainly I look around my leadership team and, oh my God, I have such strong, good personalities, but they're all so different, but that, that's a gift. Um, and so I think that transcended into, if I could own the responsibility of knowing what everybody's hot buttons are and what made them tick and really what their story is. Because everyone, I, someone I follow that I have a great deal of respect for, Doug Holliday, um, and just published a book last year called, you know, Rethinking Success. And his whole kind of view on life is everyone has a story and you're born into a story. What do you make out of that story? Because you look around you, you go into a store, you go walk down the street. You don't know what makes those people tick until you take the time to care. Right. Sorry, it's a long answer, but I don't know. I love people. <laughs> no, that it's 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 definitely apparent. It's great. Well, let's let's go with that a little bit. Let's go back to kind of when you were growing up. So you moved a lot and sort of moving around and things like that. Uh, tell us a little bit about the the younger Cheryl Palmer and you know you know when you were you know, let's just say eight or ten. Like, did you know what you wanted to be when you were growing up and? And how did you sort of find yourself here or in home building, I should say? Well, that was definitely an accident, but um, so, you know, this is going to be where the, probably the younger version of myself was probably a spoiled brat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you don't know how good you have it until you, you keep going. And I had two wonderful parents, but my mom was very career oriented she, like I said, was in the fashion industry. She was gone a lot. She traveled the world. She was, gosh, I think in China, one month a quarter. Wow. So my dad home a lot. And my dad's just, my dad was just ugh, a very special man. Um, <laughs> and had a lot of my, my leadership lessons around people from him. But because mom wasn't home, and I'm old, so this was a long time ago, when people's parents were home. Um, I kind of resented it. I resented that, you know, there wasn't milk and cookies when I got home from school and that because my mom was in the fashion industry that we didn't get to shop. We had to, you know, take her clothes and that she designed. And like I said, a really spoiled brat. <laughs> but, so, I grew up really believing that the most important thing for me was I wanted to be home. I wanted to have kids and I wanted to be home. And I thought so I was going to be a school teacher. I was going to be a special ed school teacher and be home at three o'clock every day, be off for summers with my kids, all the things that I thought I missed. And you can tell I did really good at that. I was going to say, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> Not so well, right? So um, the I success of your mother may have rubbed off on you. Just saying. I mean, there may yeah. have been something there. They say the apple doesn't fall far you learn the good the bad um but so this was an accident I went to school to go into special ed and I did a lot of stuff with uh, crisis centers and I just have such a passion for little babies at the end of the day I don't know if I could have done it because it broke my heart too right. um and then I started working for McDonald's and then I was in marketing and then I was in an agency and then I had a home builder it's a very long story as one of my accounts and it was Del Webb. And then they're like, come inside, work at the corporate office. And I'm like, wow, let's try that. <laughs> and then it just, you know, Molly, home building 
that's in your blood left the marketing side of home building and went into the operations and sales management and everything else and god once i did that oh my gosh the passion that this was creating that vision and building communities where people could raise families never looked back it's yeah it is a little contagious right i mean you it's it's hard not to fall in love with it well and when you really think about it you're designing probably the most important hub of everyone's life, which is their home. I mean, what bigger place can you make a difference if people matter to you, right? So it's pretty compelling. It, it's, it's remarkable. And my stupid 30 second story that I'll tell that just, I mean, when you sit around the table at Christmas time, you're telling stories about when you grew up, as, you know, the older version and you have all those memories. You know, my daughter now has, one of my daughters now has two children. And I think about her best friend, you know, was they were born next door neighbors because that's oh. where they grew up. And even left at five years old, we left that house because then we moved a lot, exactly what I didn't want to do with my kids. Um, but, you know, five years old, we left. And then it was her college roommate and her, you know, maid of honor and, so you think about the relationships that we allow families to create and the memory. What we do is really cool. It is. And I love the concept of building communities. I think it's amazing. It is. So so let's look back. So you joined then Del Webb. Tell us a little bit about your career there and just, you know, were there key moments that like when this happened or that happened, I just, you know that helped to sort of transition from here to there. Like, tell us a little bit about how you grew in your career, like I guess said differently. Yeah, you know, I think I've always had the philosophy is, you know, just, you know, keep going, try new things. And so when I was in marketing and Del Webb said, come inside, be our advertising manager, I'm like, why not? I haven't done that before, right? <laughs> you know, you kind of, my whole career has been a little bit of fake until you make it. To that next <laughs> level. You, just, you, you, you learn and you grow. And so I did that. But when I got to the corporate office at Del Webb, I have to be honest, it was one of the few jobs I didn't love. Um, and I didn't love it because I had been in the advertising world and it's a little bit footloose, fancy, free, and it's creative. creative. And, yeah. <laughs> and you just, it's a very different environment. And then I get to this really corporate environment and, you know, we couldn't wear nail polish and we couldn't, you know, <laughs> you had to wear panty clothes. And I'm like, this is not me. <laughs> and because it just, I just didn't feel at home. And, um, can I ask one, uh, could, was it really a thing you couldn't wear nail polish? It was really a thing. You had to wear clear nail polish. Oh my God. Um, who made that rule? And up? you had to wear pantyhose. It was Del Webb. It was very corporate. And you had oh, to wear that's so you funny. had to wear pantyhose every day. And that's just not really comfortable. <laughs> we had some weird dress codes when I was at the Irvine Committee. There were some weird things that I was like, really? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know. It was like really silly stuff when you fast forward, you know, 40 years, right? Um, but it was real. And so I just thought, huh, I just don't know if I love this. Um, and the doors were all locked and you have to pass keys to like get into people's offices. It was just really a weird environment. And one of the um, presidents of one of the Sun Cities, actually the one in Phoenix, because I was working for an agency in Phoenix, and we were good friends. And he's like, don't go. Just why don't you come be a sales manager? I've never sold. Well, go get your license. So two weeks later, I had my license and I was probably, you know, the, the old age of 26 years old, 27, and I'm going to go be a sales manager at Sun City, where the average age of the sales team was probably 60 or 65, which is, <laughs> by the way, very young today. Um, and I've never sold and I'm going to go manage. But, you know, as crazy as it was, because I didn't have sales experience to offer them. Um, it was, how do you help them? Because right. the power of the position. Matters. And so I learned a lot about leadership. How do I create value for this team that knows 10 times more than I do? And I had, I think, 35 salespeople in our sales office. We did about a thousand houses wow. a year there. Masters in sales, right? In a year. 
I learned a lot. Um, and so I was the sales manager and it was fun. And then I got an opportunity. Um, I got a call to go up to Northern California in this startup. It was Blackhawk Corporation. And they were going to do active adult communities in Brentwood and Rio Vista. And they're like, why don't you come kind of run the operations? Well, I've never done operations, but why not? Let's try it. <laughs> What's the worst thing? Right? And so I did. And that was really cool because that's where you really do get the view of community development. So that's probably when I really, I loved Dell Web. I did. I loved building the community and getting to help all these homeowners. They thought I was their granddaughter. I loved it. <laughs> but then, when I went up to Brentwood and you kind of start to see all the pieces come together, um, that was amazing. And so I did that for, gosh, 10 years. And Ken Daring was our founder. And, you know, we were just a little tax deduction for him. And at some point, I think Ken was in his late seventies and he was going to sell the company. And he, one of the Somersets, he um, was going to sell to Pulte, long story, but they tried to buy it, it broke apart then came back together. And, or they actually, excuse me, they offered me to come work for them, but I didn't know how I was going to leave Blackhawk. And then I ended up putting the deal together kind of on both sides, because now this is the company I've been loyal to for 10 years. And this is the company that wants me to come work for them to run their kind of adult, active adult business. So kind of did both sides of that. Right. Action. It's like, where's your loyalty, right? <laughs> um, but if both parties win, there's a way to make it work. And we got the deal done. We waited till the closing. And then I left and I moved back to Arizona and I worked for Poultry Running, their active adult. And then eventually I got asked to go to Nevada and be the area president for Nevada. And then honestly, things just didn't feel as right. And I left Poultry probably after three, four years. And I thought I was going to retire because my, um, daughter was about to be a senior and I had done exactly what I didn't plan on doing and been working too hard, too much on the road. And I thought, you know, it'd be really good to get to know her before she goes. And um, I took a year off. Nice. And um, it was really, it was really spectacular actually. Um, and after about a year, my husband's like, don't you think you should go back to work? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Aren't you ready? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you're like home too much. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Morris and Holmes called me and first I said, no, I'm actually enjoying some consulting and being home. And, um, and then they called again and the whole international, I hadn't done that yet. So they're a UK owned company with, you know, U.S. and we were had kind of started moving to those tough times of like 2006 and seven. And, you know, I was in Vegas, that was ground zero. So they wanted that experience. Right. And I, and I thought, God, this is kind of cool. I've not done the international. I've got these UK owners. So I said, yes, I went to work as like, I think they're a Western regional president. And I think the next day after I started uh, discussions, I heard this rumor that they were thinking about merging these two companies, Taylor Woodrow and Morrison Homes. And six months later, that came together. And then 30 days later, I got asked to be the CEO. And that was back in 2007. Wow. So you yeah. join you join Morrison and a week later, they ask you to be the CEO. Tell us how that went. No. The week later, I heard that these two companies, oh, gotcha. were, there was a negotiated, but that takes a long time. Sure. So we started in the summer of 06. The deal closed in literally the late spring, early summer of 07. And then a month after the closing, because now that my new, I have a new boss, you know, everything was changing. Um, that's when I got asked to be the CEO and, you know, here it was, I'm a regional president. I'm now going to be a CEO of this for public UK company with a private U S 
North American business because now we had Canada and I didn't know what it meant to be a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, um, hmm. <laughs> here we go again. Um, and you know, if it was 2007, you know, you would almost say the like the bottom, but you know something we needed each other to survive. Both these companies did. And my boss in the UK was amazing. And he was actually relatively new as the CEO of the whole group. Um, and then probably six months later, I got asked to join the UK board. So the next, you know, gosh, seven years I spent on the UK board. What an amazing experience that was. Um, then we sold to private equity because as we were coming through the downturn, the UK, the city, they call like the street that we have, the city in the UK really felt they needed to focus their attention on um, a UK business and the North American business was a distraction. So they sold us to private equity. So here we go again. I'd heard all about private equity, but I had never done private equity. And that took me from 2011. Um, then they we took, took the company public in 13. They sold all their interest in 2017. So we've been fully floated since then. So it's been 15 years, but I feel like I've worked for a private sub, public, a private equity, a partially floated public, and then fully floated public. So it's been, I couldn't have written this. I couldn't have imagined this script 10 years ago. That's amazing. Let me ask you this. When you look back at your career, and in, in every case, I, I loved your phrase. Um, I just thought about how I could help, right? I mean, I mean, I think that's that's how I like to approach what I do too, is is at the end of the day, you're never selling, you're just figuring out how you can help people, right? And so when you look back at sort of the key ingredients, what do you think led to the constant promotion and saying, hey, we're gonna give this person a try and I think they could do this, even though they've never done, let's say, the sales manager or advertising. In every case, you were given these new opportunities and in, in new venues. What would mm -hmm. you say drove that? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think it goes back to the basics. I think, first of all, hard work. There isn't for sure. Cuts, right. Um, so even you know, you have to put in the time. And there's just hard work and there's real grit that goes in because each opportunity, there's a lot to learn, right? Right. So I think that's, I think too, I always believed, Molly, there's some things I'm good at. There's some things I've never been exposed to. I'm always going to make sure the people that I'm surrounded with are so much smarter and better than me. And, and I think that's, a, I think that's a challenge for a lot of leaders. They feel like they have to have all the answers. I have so few of the answers. <laughs> um, I have great talent around me. And so I think, you know, when you build relationships, I mean, I think back, and this is going to be sound so silly, but I think back to when I started at, as the sales manager at Sun City, I didn't know how to read a floor plan. Okay, here I'm a sales manager and I had never bought a house yet. So how do I, I don't even know how to read a floor plan. Crazy. Um, and, but it, it was crazy. But the VP of construction was a nice guy. And right. you know, before that, construction weren't supposed to talk to each other, right? That's not how it worked back in the 80s. And I didn't understand that. He's just a really nice guy. And so guess what? We became friends. And he'd meet me at six in the morning to teach me how to read floor plans. It's like, Cheryl, this is a door. Awesome. It swings. That dotted line. Yeah. You know? I could teach him stuff about marketing or sales and, and the same with my finance VP. And so I just had probably this insatiable curiosity that just kept wanting to, you know, learn and then using that knowledge to help. And I think at the end of the day, there was just nothing I wasn't willing to tackle. Um, and just, you know, just a, a happy kind of go get it drive to get things done. And I think, I think you touched on a lot of key points, you know, working hard, making sure people know that you're going to do everything it takes. Right. And, and we are all better 
based on the people we have around us. Right. So just Mm -hmm. having those people there to support you and the confidence, and it's truly confidence to ask what you don't know to the people who do know is a big deal. Right. I mean, that's, that's really key. And humility, right? Right. Exactly. To be okay with not being the smartest person in the room and the knowing that, I mean, gosh, can you imagine when we start learn when we stop learning from others, what a boring world that would be. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, I think, but I think that's hard for some people. I really do. I do too, actually. No, I do too. Well, looking back at this amazing career, is there, do you have any sort of like do-overs that you'd like to do over? You know, <laughs> um, I don't know if I should go here, but <laughs> I think women generally lack confidence. And I think we try to make up for that by working extra hard and sure. feeling like we have to do it all. And, you know, we have to be the first person in and we have to be the last one to go home. And we can't ask to go take our daughter to a soccer game or something like that. Right. Um, and so I think I, I wish I had figured out balance better. I mean, that would have been my do over is you don't have to work 24 seven. You have to work hard. Um, but I think I had, I wish I would have balanced life a little better because, you know, there are trade-offs for the success I've had. And I don't know that you have to do it that way. It's, it's really so funny. That but I, been I think that's probably the biggest struggle of all working women is figuring out how to balance that. I don't think you're alone there. I'm sure your mom was the same way and probably struggled with that very same issue. Oh, that makes me teary. <laughs> <laughs> circle. So I wish, but when I look at my career trajectory, I don't think I would have changed a thing because every opportunity I had the most amazing experiences. I mean, I worked for Ray Kroc in McDonald's. He was in the same office. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. I mean, I did his birthday party at Padre stadium, you know, his (laughs) birthday party. I I just had the most amazing opportunities. I went trade. I got you know, being on the UK board and learning that culture. I just want to trade one of them, Molly. That's, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty great. Hmm. One characteristic about Ray Kroc that you loved. Oh man. <laughs> um, yeah. He said it as it was. Um, <laughs> one of my greatest, greatest, greatest teaching moments or moments of learning. I think I was 20 years old and I was the marketing manager for San Diego and I was doing my first really big presentation. And this will date me because we used overheads back then. You know, we didn't have PowerPoint. <laughs> I've been there. We had those little yeah. transparencies, right? I went on the machine and he wheeled into the meeting. Of course, when I happened to be on is like my new job and my first presentation to this big group. And he couldn't see the presentation. And he starts yelling at me from the back of the room. And, you know, I'm trying to like turn the, right. the overhead to make it go bigger. And I'm trying to move the table. And he's yelling and saying, why do people uh. use these if nobody can read them? And my boss looked at me from the front row and said, turn it off. And so then I had to give my first big presentation from memory. Without cue cards. And <laughs> Oh, and after I like left, after I was done, I left and I just cried my eyes out. But (laughs) (laughs) what it did was it probably changed my career. I mean, my poor team suffers to this day because I'm probably scarred that (laughs) we rehearse. (laughs) We always have a backup presentation. We rehearse before board meetings. We really just talk about things because you just never know what your technology is going to do. And um, so it, it, it was one of my greatest teaching moments about preparedness for sure in my whole career. Oh, that's so funny. That is so funny. Well, I'm going to do, let's, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to do a couple of quick round of questions with you. Um, what's your favorite pastime? Like if you're not at work, what are you doing? Or what would you love to be the doing? Beach. Huh? The beach. Nice. The beach is my happy place. Mine too. 
Uh, what about place to vacation? Probably the same answer. <laughs> the beach. The beach, right. <laughs> what did you not get about beach? Do you have a favorite sport? Golf. Golf. I love it. Okay, so now we're going to do word association. What do you think of when you think of the word quality? Housing. What about the word home building? Community. And the last one, what about the word affordable? Critical. I agree. So on that note, how do we get more affordable housing? You know, Molly, that's, that's a whole day discussion. Um, our country is probably going to look at housing, maybe mirroring other countries where, you know, a larger percent of people's income might be dedicated to housing. But I think it's incumbent on us as builders to look at how we provide quality communities. Um, I mean, you can continue to shrink the size, right? But I think we have to look at how to, from an infrastructure, how do we just bring the costs down? Um, so I don't think there's an easy answer here. I don't think there's one thing, um, but I think the next 12, 24 months are gonna be very interesting. I, I do think when you really look at it, you know, the average size home before 1950 was a thousand square feet. And I, I do think when you look at it, if you look at the fact that the household size was twice the size back then, and yet we had less than half the size of a home, we've just got to get better with space too, right? And we just have we to do. get back to that. So I, I think that's and it's so- And it's different by city, right? Because some cities have done really good with multifamily and density, and others, it's foreign. So I don't think it's the same answer by consumer group or by geography. I agree. Um, but huge opportunities. We can, like I said, we can learn a lot. I think that was part of my benefit of getting to be part of a multinational with Canada and Spain and the UK. There's a lot to be learned. How fascinating. Um, but it's still adjustment because it's not the American way. I actually love to study density and floor plans in some of the outer countries because frankly, they've, they've been forced to work with smaller, I like Japan and some of those. It's, it's really incredible. Well, tell me this. What advice would you give to a young consumer who's looking for a new home today? Um, you know, I think the last 12 months of buying a house has been the most frustrating experience for a consumer than I ever recall. And honestly, I'm sure consumers think, you know, the big bag, the builders have just, you know, been raising prices. It's been hard for us too. Um, not being able to meet the demand of consumers. Um, not being able to be 100% confident on when that house is going to get built. I, I think it's been just a hard environment and not fun for anybody. Um, so today, you know, I, I think, I, I do think we're going to see, I hope we're going to see some normalcy with the actions of the Fed and the level of appreciation we've had and things are going to, you know, I don't know exactly what normal means, but I think we are going to see some level of normalization. And so I just think the consumer really has to, it's the time to kind of take a real look, do your homework, lots at last, ask lots of questions, certainly about understand the supply characteristics um, within, you know, the area that you want to buy, really understand the speed of price movement that happened. Um, you know, the frenzy is not, always the best thing to follow, but it's kind of what people do. But I think it's a good time to kind of survey the environment and understand. I, I do think, you know, housing in the middle, I think it's going to stay strong for years to come because of all the things we've talked about around price movement and interest rates, we don't have a shelter in our. Right. We just don't. And so I, I believe her that, you know, things continue to move on, but there's an adjustment um, that everyone, and part of it is emotional, right? So I just think do your homework. It's a big investment. You feel really good about the builder, the quality, the community, that it's everything you want it to be. Um, and then go with it, go for it. Well, and, and on that note, what makes Taylor Morrison's homes different? What do you think as you're out there looking what do you really strive for in, you know, every home, you know, your team is building and, and how are you guys 
trying to make a difference and are different out there in the, the world of new homes? Yeah, I think it goes back to where we started community. You know, I see us as a community builder and home builder and getting that sense of community right is so important. And, and that probably came to me through my Dell Webb experience. The houses were interchangeable. It was about the community, right? That you were right. going to live in and the relationships and goes back to what I said about my daughter and, you know, her best friend. And um, so we see ourselves as a community building and the, the quality of planning. And, and hey, I think COVID put that on steroids, Cam. Um, truly, I think about, um, you know, when I used to like drive communities during COVID, you would see like, like all these chairs outside and kids playing and bikes and stuff that we kind of lost our way on and truly sense of community. Right. And so I think that is a big part of our difference where we start from looking at the land and how do we really create a community that people can be proud of because that's sustainable, that protects their values, all those good things. Um, and then how do we continue to, to stay one step ahead? You know, I look at our virtual environment, Molly, and how have we try, really progressed and kind of meet the customer where they want to be and understand what their needs are. And the way we're selling houses today, I don't think we ever thought possible it was two, three years ago. Sight unseen, you know, the whole virtual environment, reservations online, building houses online like Tesla. I mean, things that, you know, our, our industry hasn't changed a lot over the years. Right. So I'm pretty excited about the Taylor Morrison point of difference. And then, of course, I would say, I think we have just such wonderful people that care about our customers and put that at the forefront. But having said that, and it probably goes more back to your last question to somebody that's buying a house today, be patient, eyes wide open. It's not as easy as it used to be. It's not as predictable and recognize it's not an easy process um, and that we just have to help them every step of the way. That's pretty awesome. No, I, I good answer. Great answer. Um, well, we're going to wrap up, but I, before we wrap up, I, I do want to ask you as you were, you know, you've become this, you know, not only great leader, but inspiring leader, certainly through our industry. Tell me who some of the inspiring leaders have been in your life uh, and kind of the characteristics that made up or that were mentors for you. Wow. Um, you know, it's such a, I hate to say it, it's such an interview question, but one I've always, <laughs> I've always struggled with because I, I feel like I learn from so many different folks. I, sure. I learned from Ray Kroc, you know, I learned from Bill Pulte. I learned from my boss at Sun City who took me under his wing and really helped me. And then if I were to point to one, it's my dad, um, because it was about, I just watched him. I didn't know he was different in the way he engaged with people. And when I would go to work with him and he was in retail and the way he just made everyone feel so good and so comfortable. And he was just like this big ass teddy bear. Sorry. Aww. And, but, and just watch the way he genuinely cares um, and how the, in, the impact that had on the people around him. So I think he probably inspired me more than anyone. That's pretty awesome. Well, Cheryl, I think that is it. Um, I just can't thank you enough for your time. And I know you're super busy. So it was great to have a chat with you uh, and just hear about your career and what you're doing and keep doing what you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, can't thank you enough. Well, thank you. And so good to see you. Thanks for being so patient for us to get this on the calendar <laughs> and just Great to see you and a great thank you for all the great work you're doing for our industry because honestly, we need it so desperately. Things are moving at such a pace and you, you, you are an inspiration to the industry as well. So thanks so much, Molly. Thank you. No, I just like you, just work hard and keep trying. So That's right. That's all we can do every day, one day at a time. But take care <laughs> of yourself, okay? Okay. Thank you again for joining us. This is Molly Carmichael and I hope you enjoyed this series. Please hit like if you like today's broadcast and subscribe if you'd like to hear more from the best and the brightest in our industry. Take care, everyone, and I hope you join us again next time.